Sometimes God, in his mercy, grants us a wish we never really dreamed might come true. Today, one of my dreams is coming true. Forty-five years ago, when I walked through the gates at Newbold College as a very brash young American student, I never dreamed then that I might one day have the opportunity to speak to the church that gathers at a place that was transformative in my life. The short time I spent at Newbold was where my call to ministry emerged. The works I read at Newbold changed my life forever. And ever since I began ministry 40 odd years ago, as some would say, it has always been a sort of secret dream that one day I might get to come back and share God's word in a place that has been so meaningful to me. Some of you I know from a variety of settings, but that is not the point we gather here to celebrate today. We gather under the word of God. You have already heard the word of God read to you today. You have already heard the most important words that will be said. There is nothing I say or that we say that holds a candle to how the word of God should fix itself in our minds. Everything else, as they say, is simply commentary. I want to share with you a letter printed in the Adventist Review more than 75 years ago. Technically, I should not call it the Adventist Review 75 years ago, for it was known for a long time as the Review and Herald. In fact, I am regularly introduced around the world as the editor of a magazine that no longer carried that name since 1978. But it is fixed in the Adventist consciousness. Some things you can't fight. The letter printed June 29, 1944. Here are the words of Adventist medic Corporal Howard Martin, stationed near Tunis in North Africa, just after Rommel's Africa Corps had been expelled from the city. Corporal Martin wrote, I hitchhiked to church there one Sabbath and was more than repaid for the effort, though the service was closing when I found the place. A Swiss family who had left their country at the outbreak of the war, invited me and four other Adventist soldiers who were there to go home to dinner. During the access domination here, our host told us there were three German brethren and one Italian, all soldiers, who attended church regularly. One had been with them so long and was considered so helpful, they elected him pastor, which work he did until the British occupation. Like us Adventists in the American army, they were in the medical corps and did not carry arms. And then in words that hinted at a greater reality than perhaps even Corporal Martin understood, he wrote, it was interesting to learn that on one Sabbath, our hosts had been out walking with those four German and Italian brethren, and the next week, Four American Seventh-day Adventist soldiers went for a Sabbath walk over the same route. I have been replaying Corporal Martin's words a lot in my mind recently. As skirmishing has begun, as grenades have been readied, as ITDs, improvised theological devices capable of explosion, are planted all around us. His words remind me that there was a time and there could be a time when to be an Adventist was a greater honor than to serve in the armed forces of your country. There was a time, still could be a time, 
when a Swiss Adventist family could go walking with the Germans one Sabbath afternoon and with the Americans the next and lament that only a war intervened. There was a time, and there still could be a time, when Adventism called us back to those two most basic metaphors of the Christian life, the journey and the dialogue. Walking together and talking together as we move toward Bunyan's celestial city. There was a time when the faith of God was understood as a dialogue and not only as an exhortation. And that time could still be now. There was a time when conversations and even disagreements were measured in miles and not in nanoseconds or hit-and-run posts on a social media page. And that time could still be now. This morning I will call it by the earliest name of the magazine that I now edit. Present Truth. Present Truth. So it won't surprise you this morning when I take you to the one story in the Gospels that almost perfectly enshrines those two values that I have said are essential for contemporary Adventism, walking and talking together, the journey and the dialogue. It only helps my case that this story is set, like few in the New Testament, at a time of day that I absolutely love. You can't tell the story of the walk to Emmaus in the glint of Easter morning sunrise. And you can't tell the story of these two sad disciples in the full-on glare of noon. No, this story has a special setting. It's not that I don't like dawn or don't like three o'clock in the afternoon. It's just that some part of my soul responds to the golden graciousness of late afternoon. The light at noon for me is far too harsh. My experience tells me that those who get all choked up at the th sight of dawn or the thought of dawn have rarely seen it. Dawn is a battle with the forces of night. Late afternoon is a reasonable surrender to the rhythms of daily life. It's a time to remember that lives need slowness as well as speed. It's a time to remember that oven birds still sing in the deep woods. It's a time when the ambient gold light of the afternoon affects us so that our egos get calmed and our ambitions recede and we learn how to learn from each other. Late afternoon is the time to straighten your bent back, to clean the garden tools. Late afternoon is the time to take a walk with a good friend. And so you'll understand that when I read the stories of the resurrection of Jesus, I'm drawn to the one that is set not in the glint of Easter morning sunrise, but in the shadows of late afternoon. For I'm convinced that Jesus will meet us at our time of day, whatever that is, and walk with us and be our friend. The fact that Luke alone among the gospel writers tells the story of the walk to Emmaus can give us some insight into Luke's skills as a chronicler and a historian. He found, some would say he sought out and found, the one story among the resurrection narratives that has no immediacy about it. He found the one story in which no one is rushing anywhere or blurting something out. Luke alone tells us the story that proceeds at just the pace of a good walk with a good friend. Luke tells us of two obscure disciples slipping out the gates of Jerusalem as the sun slides down the Sunday sky. Their destination is Emmaus, a town, we're told, some seven miles walk beyond the walls. We aren't told exactly the reason that they're making this two-hour journey, but as we study the setting of our story, we can guess that something serious was causing them to leave Jerusalem that afternoon. They had heard the report of the empty tomb from that morning. 
They had heard that dazzling angels spoke with the women who came to bring spices to the garden tomb. But even, even these reports couldn't keep them in the city. No, indeed, something fatal to their hopes had been rising in their minds. Jesus was dead. Jesus was gone. Irretrievably lost. A great but tragic figure whose bleeding body they had watched expire on Friday afternoon. 48 hours after Calvary, they had no reasons to be comforted. With typical male skepticism, Cleopas wouldn't trust the stories carried by the women, whom he probably considered overly emotional and excitable, you know. And he apparently wasn't the last man to disbelieve the witness of godly women in the history of the church. No, they were turning their backs on the cross today. They were walking away from the cross today. There wasn't some soft golden halo around those blood-stained cross beams. There were no lilies springing up where the blood had run down. The cross to them was a rock of offense, and they had stumbled. As the hours ticked away, their discipleship began unraveling like a rope that begins to fray. And there was no one to stop that fraying rope. The one who had said, come follow me, he was now lying dead as a victim of Pharisaic hatred. His body was probably in some Jerusalem garbage heap. This was not the day to be the disciple of the young teacher from Galilee. No, this was a day to slide quietly away into the shadows, to admit that following Jesus, following Jesus had all been a foolish mistake. But they were being watched by eyes that loved them. Love with wounded feet was walking close behind them. Hands, fresh healed from scars, were, were seeking to reach out and put arms around shoulders. Those lips that had so recently cried out in forsakenness from the cross longed to speak words of comfort, but, but not yet. It wasn't time yet. Jesus saw their hearts dried out with trouble. Jesus saw the tears of helplessness that streamed down their faces. Jesus read the dark fears that lurked in the corners of their minds. Everything that had seemed fresh and new and transformational about the last three years had now been buried in that tomb where Jesus was. End of story. Point final. These two disciples were like figures walking in a fog, a blurring mist of tears and dashed hopes and broken dreams. Some of you, some of us, know that fog all too well. And the heart of Jesus went out to them as it goes out to us whenever there is someone around him who is hurt and sad. Jesus longed to reveal himself to them, but the discipline of real love demanded that he wait. The God with the nail prints in his hands, he knew that there's one thing more important than momentary comfort, and that thing is the truth. For the truth will not only bring you comfort, the truth will also set you free. And so Jesus committed himself to doing something quite extraordinary. He committed himself to spending two hours with them that afternoon, walking with them on the road to Emmaus. As we might see it, it, it seems an extravagant waste of time. 
happening? How could Jesus spend so much time on the very day of his resurrection, on the critical point in salvation history, with two obscure second-string disciples of whom we never hear again in the Scripture? Ah, but you see, to Jesus, there are no obscure second-string disciples. He has no followers who are undeserving of his love and of his time. Whether your name is Chloe or Cleopas or even if you have a name of which the world never hears, Jesus will walk lonely roads with you. I testify. Jesus will spend hours alone with you. I testify. Jesus will measure the miles with you on your own Emmaus Road. For you see, Jesus invented the late afternoon walk. And he longs to make that journey with his friends. And I'll tell you this morning, my friends, that at some level, Jesus couldn't have been anywhere else on the day of his resurrection. There was a divine inevitability that Jesus would join the walking and the talking, the dialogue and the journey that was happening that day. How could he be anywhere else? He had already committed himself. He had made a promise, for wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them, and there he was in the midst of them, swinging his sandals down a dusty road joining a conversation in which he was both the subject and a participant. He had made a promise, and you know that Jesus always keeps his promises. He had pledged his presence, and he was bound by his own word to offer them nothing less than his presence. Let me go further than that this morning. I'll go so far as to tell you that the three who walked on the road to Emmaus that afternoon were in a special sense the prototype of the church of Jesus Christ. These two, Cleopas and an unnamed other, together with the risen Son of God, were the first expression we see in Scripture of the church that Jesus intended to found and the church over which he loves to be the Lord today. Those three, for three is always the essential number of the church. Those three walking together in late afternoon give us a glimpse of the essential characteristics of what it means to be the church of Jesus 20 centuries later. You don't need to wait for Pentecost to see the church of the risen Lord. You don't need to wait for loud, effusive voices in in Greek and Aramaic and Farsi and Mandarin. You don't need to wait for tongues of fire in the public square to see that Jesus is most essential and that spending time with him is the core of being a disciple. You have it all right there in the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Here's where you see the church at its most basic, at its most vital, doing its central core activity. And what is that activity? That activity is nothing less than being with Jesus, walking with Jesus, talking with Jesus, and getting all excited to tell the world about Jesus. Ask me which Bible story is foundational to the modern church, and I will always point you to the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Pentecost was weeks away. Peter's great sermon, recorded in Acts 2, hadn't even been thought of, never mind composed. The book of Acts, the book of Acts was still a distant vision in the mind of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't yet a manual for evangelism explosion. Days of reaping or net anything. Don't be misled, my friends, by all of the priority that some of Jesus' modern servants place on doing only public kinds of evangelism. Assuming that unless you fill a stadium, you haven't witnessed to the risenness of Jesus. 
Don't ever assume that there's anything that can come before the discipline of walking and talking with each other and with Jesus. Don't be dissuaded by any other gospel, even if an angel from heaven or a future editor of the General Conference magazines comes to tell you otherwise. The essential number of the church is three, not 3,000. His church is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. All we do in his name can't obscure that what he prizes most about his church is when disciples walk and talk with him and with each other. This is where the fires of the gospel are lit. This is where the torch of faith burns brightest. This is where the flame of witness is made brighter and made perpetual. All the torches we carry, all the candles we light, all the searchlights that we shine on massive national evangelistic campaigns and that are printed in the Adventist Review, they can't hide the fact that the earliest fire, the first fire, is still the most important fire. Quote Cleopas on this one, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? It is the consideration of the word of God that animates the church of Jesus Christ today. Nothing less will ever do. And it all began, my friends, with a journey and a dialogue. It all began by walking and talking with each other and the risen Lord. I remind you of these things this morning because this movement is in danger of forgetting Luke's story just now. I tell you this because we are now at a moment when the language we use is mostly proclamation and pronouncement rather than dialogue and discussion. And while I, as a preacher, certainly appreciate the importance of proclamation, you are all kind enough to be listening to me proclaim the word of God, I make no pretense that this is the only kind of witness in which the church of Jesus Christ is built and serviced and maintained and staying faithful. In our typically task-driven way, we skip right by the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, we want to go straight to Acts chapter 2, where there's something we can do, some sermon we can preach, some bold public witness. We brush right past the story that took two hours to unfold, because we want to talk about something we can measure, something that has at least five digits in it, something that can rock a stadium. Make the national news. All of those things, if genuine, first grow out of the story we are reading today. It is only because individuals agree to walk and talk together, to invite Jesus into those conversations, that we ever have a hope of seeing thousands of people come to faith. If the truth be told, we don't like stories like the Emmaus Road because there's not enough of us in them. No big things to do. No great things to measure. But you know, humans are not the focus of the story of the walk to Emmaus. Jesus and his cross and Jesus and his empty tomb are the inescapable focus of this story. One has died and one has risen. Two have listened. Two rejoice. Only when we three the gospel will his people find their voice. You know, I'm not as, many sh I'm not as sure of as many things as I was when I walked into Newbold College 45 years ago. And that's a good thing. Pushing through my own Middle Ages and crossing the mark of 60 sometime back, 
has persuaded me that the many, many certainties I had as a third-year student in college have only rarely blessed me and probably not blessed the church at all. The longer I walk, the longer I listen, the fewer things I know for sure. And that's a good thing. The list may be shorter, but it's more vital than it used to be. The number may be smaller, but the conviction is deeper than ever. And all of the load I used to carry, all that I was so sure of, was defining me and my identity from everyone else who claimed the name of Jesus. All that space is now filled with grace. Here are a few things I know for certain. He is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones and not so little ones, to him belong. They are weak, we are weak, I am weak, but he is strong. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and by him, and he himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I am certain of that. And one more thing I know for certain, one more thing you'll never shake, Emmaus is on the road to heaven. I hope you will adjust your map. Emmaus is on the road to heaven. Emmaus was the destination to which the grieving church of Jesus was traveling on the day of his resurrection, and Emmaus will be the destination to which his celebrating church today will be headed when Jesus rises the second time with healing in his wings. And the things they were doing 20 centuries ago when they discovered the risen Christ among them are identically the same things that we'll be dis doing when we discover the risen Christ among us. They were walking with each other. They were talking with each other. For all their grief and in the middle of all their sorrow, they got one thing fundamentally right. They realized that the covenant to walk together and talk together was the first step toward understanding resurrection. Walking and talking together sparked a movement that literally changed the trajectory of the world within a hundred years. One disciple wasn't walking on ahead with the other following in submission. One wasn't lecturing and the other keeping silence. One didn't do all the talking and the other do all the listening. Scripture says, and they talked together. Did you hear it? They talked together of all these things that had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. They found Jesus in the middle of their conversation. They discovered Jesus in the act of journeying together, the covenant to walk and talk together, to reason, to converse. It became the touchstone of the movement that 50 days later would explode at Pentecost and that is still having ripple effects today. At the risk of being misquoted, I will tell you that I do believe there was a big bang, and it happened on the Emmaus Road. My friends, that's just where this church and where this movement 
will also find the risen Lord in the middle of our conversations, when we gather around his word, when we faithfully place our lives in submission to the word of God and say, how do you read? Help me understand. Teach me what you know. And I will share with you what insights the Spirit is giving me. I believe in multimedia. I have spent my time in front of a camera. But let me say it. Strip away the cameras and the costumes. Leave behind the makeup and the posing of modern Christian media. Look behind the technology and all the high-end software. And yes, Daryl, the augmented reality and even the virtual reality. Pair the church of Jesus Christ down to its essentials and you will always find it doing two things. Talking to each other and walking with each other. The prophet Amos famously asked, can two walk together except they be agreed? Now believe me, I have every respect for Amos. And I have a sacred reverence for the word of God. But I don't count it any disrespect to tell you that just the inverse of Amos' line is also true. He had said, can two walk together except they be agreed? And I would add, can two agree except they walk together? Can two agree except they walked together? I want you to hear me clearly on this. There's nothing more unlike Jesus than the habit of walking only by ourselves or only with those who happen to agree with us. You know how it is. You sit in your corner. You smile at others across the room. But rarely do more than smiles meet. We commune with those who share our viewpoints. We speak with those who have our same cultural background. But the church that Jesus founded put people on the road together who didn't always see it the same way, and yet it was to that, that prototype of church, he revealed himself. Nothing so undermines our proclamation of the risenness of Jesus as the fallenness of those of us who follow him. Every broadside on a hot little website, every social media assault on the faithfulness of some church leader because someone suspects them of not believing in prophecy exactly as someone else was taught it, it's proof positive to a doubting world that Jesus must be dead. Jesus can safely be forgotten. Just look at his followers. The poet wrote... I am taught best by those who disagree with me. And for the record, I agree with the poet. Or as one of my college professors used to say, if two people are always agreeing, one of them's not necessary. My wife and I made a covenant 40 years ago last December to always stay necessary to each other. I celebrate that God gave me a woman with a great mind. And she sees the world and the church and faith from somewhat different eyes. That is what has made us want to be married to each other for the last four decades. If two people are always agreeing, one of them is not necessary. To be human, to be a Christian, to be an Adventist, to be a disciple is to at least occasionally disagree. Sometimes strongly. Always respectfully. We learn, we stretch, we grow through the process of disagreeing. Disagreement, especially the kind that results in passionate, opinionated, respectful conversation, it's exactly what this movement needs more of. If we have any in serious intention of changing the trajectory of a movement that sometimes seems stalled. It will only be because we commit ourselves to again walk with each other and talk with each other 
and listen well to viewpoints we may not find ourselves liking and submit all of this to the guiding force of the Word of God. Our accustomed ways of seeing the world are going to be challenged. There's something fundamentally innovative and creative about the mental effort it takes to have a good disagreement. I know, I've hired an entire staff like that. They sit there and zing off each other, and it sparks exactly the kind of creative environment which this old non-techie could never produce by himself. God is in the midst of her, in the ministry that attracts people of different viewpoints and different skills, different perceptions, who covenant to walk together and talk together and teach other people about Jesus. To all of those who are afraid of different points of view, let me say, bring them on. Bring them on. It will be good for us as a people if we hear each other. We will find that many things we have thought of as disagreements will melt when we begin to understand and walk and spend an afternoon with those who don't harbor our viewpoints. The most vital facts in this life that we're called to live together are the respect we owe each other and the covenant we make to gather under the word of God to submit all that we believe and all of our experience and let the Spirit help us sort out where we'd move together as a people. Jesus says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them, and so he's here in the midst of us. When we disagree, when we agree, when we sing in unison, when we sing solo, when we sing in parts. By definition, there will be differences of opinion whenever we gather. Because I respect you, I take the time to listen to you, to walk with you, to talk with you, to pray with you. These are essential disciple behaviors. As we learn to listen to each other, to bow to each other, to pray earnestly for each other, many of those things we have called disagreements will fade. I'm describing a phenomenon that maybe you have not known by any single name. So I give you a phrase to remember this way of thinking about the church. I refer to it as dialogical Adventism. Dialogical Adventism. Dialogical Adventism is the inescapable condition for faithful Adventism, creative Adventism, and witnessing Adventism. This isn't some variation of an old tradition. This isn't some departure from what the pioneers believed. No, my friends, if you know anything about the history of this movement, then you know that this movement was conceived in discussion. This movement was birthed in dialogue. This movement was breastfed on argument, and this movement grew up in a debating hall. And it's not for nothing that the signature book of this movement for the last 120 years happens to be a volume called The Great Controversy. Dialogue, hearty, thoughtful, respectful dialogue has always been one of the distinguishing marks of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I say that as the editor of a journal that precedes the founding of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I can prove it to you by showing you things that you might fear if I printed today. And they are all there under the masthead of James White and Jay and Andrews and Uriah Smith, who had minds large enough to entertain different points of view and to listen to each other. Beware of those who want to tell us that Adventism is only about unanimity and agreement. Beware of those who are afraid of vigorous discussion, because vigorous discussion always grows up when we gather around the Word. Change occurs when we gather around the Word. Change is what we need, so we must have more of talking about the Word together. Beware of an Adventism that 
forgets how democratic and egalitarian this movement was when it started. Dialogical Adventism is essential Adventism, it's core Adventism, it's undiluted Adventism, and it is unstoppable Adventism. This movement is either about a conversation and a journey, or we have lost our way. So friend, whoever you are, whether you are a disciple named Cleopas or a disciple whose name I don't yet know, you may be black or white or gloriously brown. You may come from the Caribbean. You may be Anglo. You may be joyously unassigned to the prevailing linguistic categories. You may be Asian or indigenous, rich or poor, male or female. The road stretches out in front of us. I'm committed to that journey. Are you? There are miles to go before we sleep. There are miles to go before we sing, before we rest, before we shout. We don't know just when Jesus himself will appear, but in a very real sense, he is already here among us. He pledges to walk with us as we learn to walk with each other. That is the church I want to belong to. That's the movement that I run to catch up with. That's the faith that will keep us walking and talking together as we walk through the gates of that city to come. Join me there, will you? Anyone ready for a journey and a conversation?